Hey, welcome to Overtime, where we take Sunday's message further. My name is Jeremy, and I'm your host. And this is a podcast where we just want to ask the questions that we think that you would ask as it relates to Sunday's message. And as we do so, we hope that it helps you grow in your life and your faith. With that being said, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of the podcasts that are coming out. Not only that, hit the like button, because when you do so, it helps us help other people. And if you ever have a question about Sunday's content or about Overtime, you can submit those to overtime at npaustin.com, and we will be sure to get to those in future podcasts. So with that being said, here's a quick recap of Sunday, and then we're going to jump into our conversation today. And extraordinary stories can have an extraordinary impact on our lives. And so today, to kick us off, we're going to hear about this guy, Matthias. Therefore, it's necessary to choose one of the men who've been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. It says this, so they nominated two men, Joseph, and here's our guy, Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this uh, apostolic ministry. And the lot fell on Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. Matthias began to pastor with James and Peter in Jerusalem. And I would say one of the first principles from this very faithful man is that God uses hard moments in life to refine your faith in Christ alone. God uses whatever he chooses not to remove to prepare you. It's because he knows what's coming tomorrow and he is doing things to grow you in your current today. And I think the last thing, the third thing, the principle we can glean is we would say God uses your persevering faith to inspire. So Christy, who our audience has heard from, mm-hmm. um, she's helps, great. Helps Buck and I. Buck and I aren't good at kind of small talk, so she helps us. We just go right to the point. Yeah, we get to the point. Boom. We jump in. We're, yeah. ju- we're just good at kind of the deep conversation. So mm-hmm. Christy helps us be fun. <laughs> uh, and so in in uh, in our fun for this week, uh, you know, she put in here that there was a San Antonio spelling bee. This is a very ordinary thing, spelling. Sure. But this is an extraordinary result. So there's a tie in there. Yeah. And an eighth grader was crowned the new Scripps National Spelling Bee champ after correctly spelling. Don't look down. No, you just did. Oh, I did. Dang yeah. Morhen. Pronounce. Yeah. Morhen. And then she spelled these 22 words in 90 seconds. I couldn't even say these words in 90 Or 90 know seconds. what they even mean. Yeah. Spielbone. Freel fight. Gedying. Parison. Ximer. That looks like tequila, but it's tequila. I know, tequila. that's what I want to say, tequila. Tequila. Glo- oh. Glocus, a palmant, chara. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, let's see. What, what's your favorite word on here? Or mm-hmm. You just give a go. Give a go to the one that looks the most difficult. Cicerary. <laughs> <laughs> I like ornithohincus. <laughs> Goodness. This is amazing. This just makes me feel like there's so much more in the English language that I was not even aware existed. Yeah, yeah. Like, there are words like this. Well, this is where Julie like really makes us look far better than we are Oh yeah. Um, because she spell corrects and grammar corrects so Constantly. many things with oh, our yeah. slides. And, and actually if you're someone listening and you just love spelling and grammar, mm-hmm. um, we have a role for you. Oh yeah. You could come be our just um, guardrails mm-hmm. of all things. Spelling. Who should they email? Should they email you? They can email me. Yeah. What's your email? Jeremy.edelin.com at mpawson.com. There you go. It's on the website. I'm so excited. You're going to get like 15 emails. I pro- I may- Maybe not. <laughs> I don't know if there's 15 people that listen that love spelling and oh, grammar. That's right. No. <coughs> Anyways, okay, so those are some extraordinary words mm-hmm. um, from an extraordinary eighth grader. That's impressive. And spelling is just an ordinary thing, but that is yeah. pretty cool. Um, but we kicked off a new series and uh, really just launched into summer this past Sunday. Yeah. And all things summer at North Point, Camp 75, kicked off with, with a little island in the sun um, by Weezer. And it's just a fun time in the beginning of service. And oh, then uh, also launched at the, ser- the sermon series Extraordinary, mm-hmm. or Extraordinary, depending on how you want to say it. But yeah. the whole idea is that God does extraordinary in our ordinary. Mm-hmm. And you said something in the beginning. You said uh, extraordinary stories can have an extraordinary impact on our life. Mm-hmm. And we're kind of looking at these stories throughout the series, specifically going, okay, if God does extraordinary and ordinary, um, what are the, what does he do with the ordinary aspects of our life, and how can we kind of lean into those a little bit more? And so we're looking at characters who are very ordinary in Scripture throughout the series and seeing the extraordinary things that God did in their life, and what were the principles or the things we can pull from their stories that can be helpful to us today. Mm-hmm. And we're kind of just gleaning uh, from that, you know, throughout this series. And we looked at the first one this past 
last week, and his name, the character in the story, I say character, it's a historical person. It's not a character in yeah. the story. I mean, the, I get it because I was doing the movie thing. Yeah, the yeah. historical person was Matthias. 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 It's a good name. And uh, Matthias is, and you, you talked through a couple of things. In fact, I would say maybe if you can just hit really quick kind of a um, – a uh, couple of, you know, bottom line of the series kind of, or s- sermon, kind of what you said, and then we'll jump into questions about Matthias. Yeah, I think the biggest thing with Matthias is, I mean, a lot of his <laughs> life he felt uh, uh, and experienced a lot of hardship, a lot of difficulties, and um, and he pastored in Jerusalem for several years uh, individuals that were going through hardships that we can't even imagine. So if you looked at his life, you would go, Matthias was very familiar with difficult times in life. So what did Matthias learn? Like what were the principles? Mm -hmm. And we went through some of those principles and just talked about, you know, that in the midst of hardship is where we grow in our faith and our faith is really exposed and refined in the midst of hardship is where we grow as a person. Like our character grows, our self-awareness grows, our maturity grows. And as you know, in difficulty and hardships is really where we have an opportunity to persevere, to really trust God is active and working. And if we're willing to persevere, it may not change the circumstance, but it can change the world. And it can inspire people around us to go, hey, you know, that individual went through a hardship and they were able to persevere. They were able to be faithful. They were able to grow in the midst of the hardships. So that means when I go through hardships, I also can grow. Mm -hmm. And so at the end, I just said, you know, God, use whatever you choose not to remove. So you're not this is not being removed. Would you use this in the meantime, in this difficulty in my life to really grow me and influence those around me? Yeah. Such a, yeah, such a good prayer. Heavenly father, use this until you choose to remove this. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to just like a handle for people to hold on to is, you know, whatever they're going through. Yeah. I think what's interesting about starting the series and this uh, message is, you know, in our, in our culture, you know, the value success. And um, a lot of times we go, well, success, then, then you can have an extraordinary life. You know, mm-hmm. the amount of followers you have or the house or the cars, you, you know, yeah. that's kind of cultural. And, but there's this dichotomy in culture where culture both says that like no pain, no gain, right? Mm-hmm. That's like a, that's a term we all know, you mm-hmm. know, working out, going to the gym, painful, but there's a gain. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, uh, culture says like, stay as comfortable as possible. Like, yes run from pain as fast as you can, as hard as you can. And so there's kind of these two mixed messages. So I feel like this is, while it's, it could be a cliche, like at the same time, it's something that we're we're hit from both sides of that kind of idea all the time. And so it's a really important discussion to lean in and go, okay, uh, we know that we, we understand Mm -hmm. that, you know, pain creates gain in our life, but you know, what can we really learn from Matthias in this? Yeah. And if you lined up, I think, you know, 10 people, a hundred people, a thousand people, and you said, Hey, what are the deepest lessons you learned in life? Like, what are the most valuable things? What shaped you the very most? What grew you the very most? What developed you the very most? I think across the board, like 100% of them would talk about difficult times. Yeah. And it's like, you know, the old, you know, stories of our grandfathers or grandparents of the old sage. I walked to school both, you know, uphill both ways in snow. And man, it was so difficult and hard. But wow, I learned this great character. This is where I learned how to, uh, you know, work hard. Yep. And it's like, but I'm going to prevent you. <laughs> I'm going to do everything to work hard so you don't have to experience hardship. Yeah. And which means you don't experience the deeper lessons in life, which is, it's the irony. It's the paradox. It's it's really hard because it's like, that is where we grow the very most is yeah. in the difficulty. Yeah. And as a parent too, I mean, I, I feel oh, it when yeah. I, I mean, you're, you're a parent of many years <laughs> and I'm a parent of not many years, not even a year. Well, we're both parents. Yeah. yeah. But I, I mean, I look at Grayson and I think about his life and I'm like, I'm going to protect him from everything. Right. And I'm like, uh, I probably shouldn't yeah. do that because he's just going to need to learn some valuable lessons. And, and I talked to J- Jamie Iveson who leads music on Sundays and mm-hmm. our Sunday morning services. And he has this phrase and he, he says, don't take it literally. Uh, I don't even know. If, I don't know if he listens, but Jamie, I'm sorry if I didn't <laughs> give you a heads up. I was going to say this, but um, he says like, you you almost as a parent like pray for a car crash where they don't get hurt. Yeah. Like you want something that's going to shake them up, but like not hurt them too much. Right. But you want them to like go through the difficult things of life. And he says, other, other than that, like, uh, what do you right. do? Well, it's a natural consequence. My counselor talked about all the time because we're, we're, you know, Jill and I are going like, hey, what do we do in this parenting thing? Like we're, we're stuck. Yeah. And, um, you know, the advice I got so many times was let the natural consequences play out because, you know, Luke or Sam or Timbo or whoever it may be, they're going to learn far more from the natural consequences, like, hey, they're not doing their schoolwork. Well, I can get on them so much so that forcing them to do all their schoolwork so that they pass, but if they don't pass, and therefore there's natural consequences to that, summer school or whatever that may be, they're going to learn a far greater lesson 
than right. me rescuing them. Right. And me rescuing them actually perpetuates a deeper lesson that they'll have to learn somewhere down the road, perhaps in a greater way. Yep. So it's this, it's so hard though. It's the, like you said, this dichotomy, this, you know, if I let go, then I actually, they're actually going to receive something mm-hmm. greater than I can give them by holding on. Yep. And, and how often are we mad at God for putting us in a situation when I he's know. going like, hey, kiddo, just hold on. You're going to learn something in this. I'm going to teach you something. Yeah, I met with uh, parents this morning, uh, a couple this morning, that something's going on with one of their kiddos. And they were talking about how, like, they were just so angry at God. And, you know, in our discussion, we talked about the lessons we learned through hardships. And it was fun to watch the conversation go full circle. Mm -hmm. And they walked out of the meeting, and they were, like, really thanking God for the opportunity and asking him to strengthen them. Yeah. And it was just a cool yeah. experience, but yeah. So let's dive into pain a little bit more. That sure. sounds fun. <laughs> that sounds fun. Fun podcast. Uh, as, as we jump into Matthias and his story a little bit more and just the lessons we learned, can you just, uh, again, I know you did this on Sunday, just quick summary of Matthias' life, um, you know, who he was, just quick kind of brief summary of him. Yeah. The, uh, as much as we know about him, he was, uh, he was uh, born in, in Galilee in that area. He was Jewish. Um, he was introduced to Jesus early on, uh, perhaps through James or John or one of the early followers of Jesus, one of the early disciples. Uh, he was there at the baptism when John the Baptist baptized Jesus. Mm. And so he watched all of those things take place. He heard John say, you know, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, and so, and then he, you know, whatever manifestation or miracle took place when Jesus was baptized, he was present there. And then from that point on, over the next three years, he was present. Um, I think in Luke 10, when Jesus sent out, you know, the followers, his, he says 72 followers or 70 followers in that range. Um, Matthias was one of those followers that he sent two by two all throughout different towns to talk about this incredible news of Jesus. And um, so he was in those moments. He was at the crucifixion um, and saw Jesus crucified. And he was uh, in the in the upper room with, uh, you know, the disciples and, you know, hearing like, oh, my gosh, I guess it's over. I guess he wasn't the Messiah. You know, if they killed him, are they going to kill us? Feeling all those feelings of fear. And he was at the Mount of Olives, which I talked about on Sunday, which is 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead. And he watched Jesus ascend into heaven. And so that's, you know, we get a snapshot of that in terms of Matthias um, and that he was part of all that, but that's, we get an indirect snapshot because it's not like we see Peter's name show up all throughout scriptures, Mm -hmm. you know, or Matthew, here's Matthew or what have you. Like we, we see Matthias through the 72. We know he was there. We see Matthias through the lens of Peter because in Acts, Peter was like, who's been here from the beginning? Who's seen the miracles? Who's seen Jesus's teachings? Who's been in the ups and downs? And Peter says, well, let's look at the 120 people in the room. He points to Matthias and says, well, Matthias has been here the whole time. So we get kind of a lens through Matthias. Yeah, and kind of a perspective into Matthias' faithfulness. Yeah. You know, through the crucifixion, through everything, you know, he's kind of been there through right. all. Yeah, because he had to be faithful, had to be somebody who persevered and was faithful. And, and Peter and the disciples at that time, you know, minus Judas, they all said Matthias was their guy. Mm-hmm. And so we know that. And then from church history and church tradition, um, you know, in our early church fathers, we get some historical, like, little snippets that uh, perhaps he pastored with uh, James and Peter in Jerusalem for one to two decades, and that, you know, church tradition would say that he was arrested, brought to the Jewish temple, and stoned by the Jewish religious leaders, and Mm. that was his fate. And that was a couple decades after Jesus' death. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And then, you know, uh, as I talked about on Sunday, um, eventually Constantine's mom, Helena, uh, went to Jerusalem, got his bones, and brought some of his, um, you know, his bones and remains to the church in Germany that uh, you can go visit today, and you can go to his grave, and you know, that's that's what we got on him. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay, well, that's helpful. So why why do you think he was just a footnote in the story? Well, I think it's hard because there's, um, uh, you know, there's so many things you're trying to capture in history, um, and these these uh, the individuals who wrote the letters. Um, in the New Testament, you know, there's, there's, we get multiple perspectives on history, and there's only so much they can capture. I love what John says in his letter. He said, if we captured all the things that took place, there would be volumes upon volumes upon volumes upon volumes. But John says, here's what's most important. Mm. Like, we're capturing the most important element. So, you know, he wasn't part of the twelve. 
And that was during Jesus' three-year ministry. So that's the entire three years. It focused on the 12, and it focused on those who were closest to the 12, like Mary, uh, you know, uh, Jesus' mom, Martha, and so on. So um, Matthias was there. He just wasn't one of the main, if you will, cast members, and that's why we're kind of playing this out a little bit. Like, he was in the background. Yeah. He was, you know, an extra, if yeah. you will. But he was there. He was present with Peter. He was present with John and, you know, the Nathaniel and all the guys. Um, but he wasn't one of the main characters. So as a result, he wasn't on the pages as much. Um, but again, you know, what I just explained, we do get through the lens of Peter and the lens of Luke, um, you know, the idea to go, who was this guy? We get a little bit of that perspective. So I think it's just... He wasn't one of the main characters, therefore he was not on a bunch of the pages of Scripture, but he's indirectly in the background on those pages. Yep, and you indirectly learn some things about perseverance and mm -hmm. through hardship and, and all that stuff. So, okay, cool. So if we jump into the first question, uh, kind of on the principle that we glean from Matthias' life, mm -hmm. um, why is it so hard to remember to invite God in and go to him first when we're going through hardship? Yeah. So um, I wrote a couple things down on this one. I think uh, there's four things that I wrote down that just popped in my mind that I think this is, this is why we don't do it um, in inviting God into you know, our everyday life or decisions. I think there's a practical element. And when I say practical, it just means there's not a rhythm. Um, either we're too busy, we've never learned to do this, um, there's, there's just not, this is not a rhythm of our life, this is not something, you know, from a um, you know, kind of a neuroscience perspective, there's no neural pathway here. There's no like habit that you've created mm -hmm. to go, hey, I've got all the information, but my habit is to go, even though I have all the information and I have good life experience and good wisdom, there's one thing that I always do before I make decisions. I just invite God into this. If that's not a habit, then practically speaking, you're probably going to miss this time and time again. So that's why we don't invite God. And I don't think it's malicious. I just think it's habitual. I just think it's a very practical thing, and there are other things that take precedent. So I think there's a practical element. I think there's a spiritual one. You know, perhaps you haven't been taught this. Maybe the pastor hasn't spoken of this or, you know, you haven't read a book. Or There's a spiritual element to where you, you just – this is not front and center. This is not something you're being reminded of spiritually. I think there's a relational element. Um, if you don't have somebody on the other side of you, like the scriptures say, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, or as the Proverbs say, you know, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses, so you need somebody on the other side of you reflecting things maybe you don't want to hear, but you need to hear. Um, this would be a relational piece that if you have somebody sharpening you, the other person on the other side of you would ask you, you know, in a marriage or with your kids or, you know, with dating or with whatever it is, hey, if you're going to date that person, hey, have you invited God into that? Hey, what do you think God said? So if you and I were, you know, in that, like, friends before we got married and we were making those big relational decisions, like, that would be something I would hope you would ask me and you would hope I would ask you on a relational, you know, that we're encouraging one another to invite God in. So if you don't have a relationship like that or not part of a small group that's inviting, like challenging one another to do that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a reason. And then I think experiential. If you haven't done it and no one's holding you accountable to it and you haven't learned it spiritually, then you probably haven't experienced like, <laughs> the benefit of it. Like you haven't sat there and went, man, I invited God in. I had the wisdom. I had the data. I thought this was the best decision, but I was able to be, be still and recognize that he's God, and that God would have me go in a different direction. And when you experience something like that, and you experience like God leaning in to something that may not be logical, it may not be as rational, it may not be what all the data suggests, but it's what God has prompted you to do, and then you do it and you see the fruit and the outcome and experience that, and once you do that, then it's like, it's like you, you cannot not invite God mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. but it takes the experience. So I think from a practical, spiritual, relational, and experiential, I think those elements would be why we don't do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I think too, I'll just add on to that. It's probably the difference between believing and following and the gap between those two mm -hmm. that we learn to invite God in, you know, more like when we first put our faith in, in Christ, we're not uh, mentally kind of programmed in that moment to go, well, now I invite God into everything. And now, you know, it's just all good. Mm -hmm. It's like we, we are, our brain, our brains have literally been wired one way and through neuroplasticity, which, you know, modern day science has picked up, we're now rewiring our brains to make Jesus, not just a reference point or a character, you know, a historical person, but actually the, the context for our entire life. Right. And that just takes a following, 
you know, over years. Yeah, and years discipline, and years. following, learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It reminds me of like Romans 12 where it says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but mm-hmm. be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve God's will as good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I'll be able to see God. I'll be able to see direction. But it's a result of a transformed mind, which is a result of a habit of inviting God to say, God, how do you see this? Mm -hmm. God, what is wise here to do? God, what would you have me do? How how do you view these things? So, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, and I I would just say, too, like a pace of life um, feels like it's an obstacle to doing that, too. If we don't have regular time, I mean, it's it's just you you don't grow in relationship with somebody without time spent in that relationship. And so, one, if you don't have regular time where you are slowing down enough to invite God into your Mm -hmm. day-to-day, into your ordinary, you're going to miss some of the extraordinary things he has for you. Um, And if you don't have not just day-to-day pace changes, but um, seasonal pace changes. Like, you know, if you're, you're sprinting in life, right, you know, and you don't take a couple of days or a weekend or do the thing that, you know, whatever it is that God, um, we all meet, you know, kind of connect with God in different ways. Like, for me, it's nature. Like, I know mm-hmm. if I go long enough and I don't end up, you know, going out and getting into nature a little bit, going to the mountains, it just fills up my soul in a, in a big way. And without that, I end up missing inviting God into things that, you know, I, I need to invite him into. Right. You know. Yeah, spot on. So do you think God has extraordinary for all of us if we remain faithful and persevere? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 why? Like unpack that. What does it look like? What can what can the extraordinary look like in our life? So uh, a couple things I would point to first. I think Matthew 7 Galatians 6 and the story of Joseph. I wrote those those things just popped in my mind when uh, you know I read this question. Matthew 7 is where Jesus teaches the Sermon on the Mount. So he teaches about all these very practical things and this is what you alluded to. So he's taught it. Now are you going to trust and follow? And then he he wraps up the whole Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. He's, in essence in summary, he says if you apply this, it's like putting you, the foundation of your home on rock, solid rock. If you don't apply what I've taught you and you choose not to do that, then it's like building the foundation of your home on sand. And then he says, because in life, difficulty will come your way. The storms of life will come. It's guaranteed. Jesus was very upfront about you will face trouble in this life. When they come, it's going to wipe you out. When they come, you're not going to stand up under it. When they come, it's going to you know take out your foundation. If you have not applied the words I've said, but if you do apply the words I've said, the storms of life will come and you will persevere. The storms of life will come and your foundation will allow you to experience the blessing of God, the extraordinary of God. And so application of what Jesus teaches is one way we begin to experience the fruit of, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of a sudden, all of those are manifesting and growing the size, in size and growing in maturity as a result of the application of what Jesus has asked us to do. Um, I think the, the other verse that speaks into this is Galatians 6, where Paul is saying, let us not become wary and doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So there's a perseverance aspect and I love that he says harvest because it's like planting and, you know, watering and all these kind of things. So we're like persevering and the crop's not growing and it's not growing and we're not seeing results. Well, we want instant gratification right away. But what Paul is teaching us is to say God is right there the whole time. Don't give up doing good things. Don't give up applying the very words of Jesus. Don't give up, you know, allowing your mind to be transformed to his mind because at the proper time, this is, you know, in a marriage. This is in a difficulty. This is in a moment of joy. You're going to reap this harvest, this harvest of, again, this peace, this patience, this kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then I think, you know, uh, the story of Joseph just popped in my mind because he, he, he didn't hear from God for 15 years in prison. <laughs> and we're like 15 minutes. God, you hadn't said anything like, I guess God's not there. <laughs> And this is something you read throughout the scriptures, is there was this be still and know that I am God, waiting upon the Lord. And waiting upon the Lord could be for years. And that is not emotionally satisfying to hear, but it's true. 
And this is how the Lord works because he's working in you. He's doing things to transform you, to re-engineer you, to remodel you. And some of those are deep, deep things in you, and it takes a while. But then the fruit is, I think what the extraordinary is, is that you're able to sit in rooms in difficult situations that you could never sit before. You're able to speak into the lives of your children in a depth and to the in, engage their hearts in a way you couldn't speak in before. You're able to look into the, the eyes of your wife and have incredible patience and be able to love her unconditionally even though she may not be doing the things you want her to do that there's an unconditional love that pours out of you that you're like this is incredible I don't know where this comes from but I actually have something I otherwise wouldn't have had if I wouldn't have applied the things that Jesus had taught. And this is that fruit that starts to come out of you. This is that peace for your soul where Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. This is where Jesus says to the disciples at the woman in the well, I have food you don't know about. There is this contentment, there is this joy, there is this peace, there is this satisfaction, there is this patience in life that we all long for, this happiness that can actually be satiated and satisfied in Christ and applying these things. And that is the fruit. That's the extraordinary. And um, that's the deeper things of life I think you begin to experience. Yeah. I think so often, we're like you mentioned a second ago, we're, we're tempted to give up, mm -hmm. you know, or we're tempted to um, just kind of give in and we read a book um, as a leadership team a couple years back called leadership pain mm -hmm. by samuel chand mm -hmm. is that who it is mm -hmm. and uh it's such a such a good book and in the book he talks about this idea of liminal space <clears throat> where liminal space is transition from where you are to where you're going and most of the time in that like perseverance and in that hardship we find ourselves in that liminal space where we're we're past the point of where we were, where we know that the hardship has begun, mm -hmm. but we're not quite to like the end of the hardship to where we reap the, the fruit of like persevering through it. And he, he says, you know, it's a hallway between, hallway between the past and the future. It, it feels like hell in the hallways. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think, I think culturally like instant gratification, um, we are just so tempted to shortcut the hallway. And uh, one of my one of my favorite little bottom lines from a sermon, Judd Wilhite, a pastor of uh, mm -hmm. Central Church in Las Vegas, says, if you shortcut the struggle, you shortchange the breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And so if you take a shortcut, you're mm -hmm. potentially shortchanging a breakthrough that God has for you um, at the end of that liminal space. And, you know, you, you said something to me yesterday um, about internal, external change. Mm -hmm. And you were like, man, it sounds like there's a lot of things changing externally that are doing something in you internally. And as I was driving to work today, I just had the thought that um, in that liminal space, we are so tempted to make a change externally. And mm -hmm. then we put this expectation on that external change, thinking that's going to change something internal. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think about how many marriages or how many job changes or how many, you know, just um, I'm going to abandon this thing that I've built up and I'm going to go a different direction because I have this internal angst mm -hmm. with it. I put the expectation on that. That's going to change what's going on in here mm -hmm. versus, you know, going to your heart, your heart, everything you do flows from it, like the proverb talks about, mm -hmm. and changing what's going on in your heart and, and seeing what God does externally as a result of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the fruit you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, I think in a, in a lot of ways is, uh, is getting to the end of that hallway and having that internal change you know, not just the external change. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I love it. And that's where, you know, the Proverbs talk about, you know, trust in the mm -hmm. Lord, lean lean in his understanding, not ours. I mean, that's, <clears throat> it's a really hard, I mean, this is where relationships and one another's are so important in your life because it may be time for you to change a job. There may be time for an external change, you know, and it's, it's having people in your life to be able to help you discern, um, to help you see things you, perhaps you cannot see. But oftentimes, in those angst moments of life, um, it is the God is doing something, and if we can trust in His understanding and not lean on our understanding, and just go, maybe there's a work He's doing here. Maybe He's refining or exposing something in my faith. Maybe He's maturing me or allowing me to see something about myself that I otherwise wouldn't see. Maybe He's allowing me to experience perseverance because it will inspire those on the other side of me. That perseverance aspect. Mm -hmm. There's there's so much more going on that. Um, you know, when it's like the, you know, the passage, be still until you can get to the place to know that he is God. 
and that God is working in this and then, then make the decision. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that be still peace is I think really important because so often we, we can equate, okay, pain with progress. If I just struggle through it, if I just make it through, whereas that like reflection piece is really important and, um, you have to add that to the pain yeah. in order to experience the progress. Well, and this, <clears throat> this is a big theological, uh, um, component to what you just said is, and y- people land all, uh, on two different sides of this theological component of free will. That God, I believe, God will allow you to do what you want to do. And that's a pretty heavy burden to carry. Mm -hmm. Because you can do what you want to do. Thy will be done. Not God's will, thy will. So in other words, if you want to go chase that relationship, if you want to cross that moral line, (coughs) if you want to go pursue that job, like those things will ultimately will hurt you. That's not what God invited you into. That's not what God would invite you to say. That's where you're going to experience maximum freedom. That's where you're going to experience, you know, what I have for you, the plans I have for you, because you're free to do what you want to do. And with that, I I think it does add a deeper conviction to go, I need to be still. I need to invite God in because if what he has for me, I have the capacity to miss, then I really need to hear from him before I make this decision. Yeah, yeah. So I think the application and everything we're saying is for people who are in the liminal space Mm -hmm. and are stuck between where they are and where they want to be and are maybe fed up with the ordinary and they're ready to, you know, jump ship, make a change. I think the application is, Hey, God has something for you. Yeah. And if you, if you persevere, if you stick it out, um, it's like Romans five, three, you know, perseverance is going to, or suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance is going to produce character and that character is going to produce hope in your life. Mm -hmm. Um, if you stick it out. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, so what, uh, how can we recognize things that are extraordinary in our own, in our own life? Kind of just going to every day to day, you know, ordinary, how can we recognize that there is extraordinary in our life that God has for us? Yeah, I think, I don't know if I have a really good answer to this. I think uh, the two things that hit my mind is, uh, watch your emotional responses. It's number one. And then number two is just count your blessings. So no, is watch your emotional responses. And what I mean by this is that, <clears throat> You know, and if somebody is on the other side of you and they do something and your typical response was quick, your typical response is jump in, your typical response is to react and try mm-hmm. to control, but you're beginning to watch your emotional response and there's a little bit more grace in that. There's a little bit more patience in that. There's a little bit more, I believe the best on the other side of me. There's a little bit more of, I'm not going to judge that so quickly because maybe there's information I'm not aware of. What's happening in that moment, and the reason why I say that is because that is the extraordinary. That is the depth. That is the rest. That is the fruit that you're starting to experience. And I would say gauge your emotional responses. Um, and um, I think that's where the extraordinary is found, and especially in just general contentment, general joy, uh, general happiness. Um, you know, but I do think in, uh, you know, in relational conflict, when things don't go your way, when you receive bad news, how are you responding? When somebody says something offensive, um, when s- somebody accuses you of something that's false, you know, I'm not saying you, you should be passive and not defend. That is not at all what I'm saying. But watch your emotional responses because that is where the extraordinary happens. And all, all of a sudden, you begin to discover the extraordinary on the other side of you because if you're not quick to, to assume, you're not quick to judge, and you're quick to ask questions, now all of a sudden there's a, there's a security, there's a patience that allows you to actually get greater context to make better decisions and better judgments. Um, and that's, I think, in Matthew 7, 7, where Jesus says, do not judge, and everybody uses that to say, oh, see, the Bible says not to judge. That's totally not what he says. He says, do not judge incorrectly, but by all means judge. In other words, he's like, take the plank out of your own eye before you're looking at the speck in that. Mm-hmm. When you're able to get to that place, because emotionally there's content, there's security in the Lord, there is peace in the Lord, there is rest in the Lord, and that you're, you go, well, you, you know, whoever said whatever they said or whoever did whatever they did, that you have this extraordinary kind of patience that doesn't really come from you. That is the extraordinary because then you begin to see a whole other aspect of life. So I think it's that. And then, um, you know, I said this a couple weeks ago on stage. I'm like, my life is awesome. And I said that because I just paused a second and looked at my life. And I said, I have a house. You know, I have 
multiple cars because my sons have cars and we have a grandfather who buys all the cars for my sons, which I'm really grateful for. Yeah. You know, I've got a garage with two f- refrigerators. You know, my uncle gave us one. And you have and, a room for your cars. And I have a room for my cars. You know, I have AC. I've got multiple restrooms. You know, I've got a thing on my phone that turns on my AC. You know, I can just sit in bed and go like 72 or 68. You know, I can... Mm-hmm. I can do all these. I've got a TV, you know, I've got a, um, Oculus thing, the thing, the, oh virtual, yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. Got, you know, I just started going through those things and I was like, my life is amazing. I've got so many things. And I think just a, a quick inventory of life. That's why I just said, count your blessings. Like, yeah. Sometimes you go, I have overlooked how blessed I am, how much God has done for me, how much extraordinary there is in my life. And then I just thought of one. The third one is just go on a mission trip. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pretty, you're like, my life's pretty extraordinary. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, how can we recognize the extraordinary life? To Simply put, look for it. Right. Like, it's right in front of you. Sure. You're just not looking. Like you said to me yesterday, like, you're going to see what you're looking for. Yeah. And, like, just look for it. And mm-hmm. you're going to see it all over. I told you about when I um, got up way too early on Saturday. I was sitting out on the patio with a cup of coffee, like, 6 a.m. And there was this massive thunderstorm going through. Mm-hmm. And I had this, like, crazy experience with rainbow and lightning and all this stuff. It was just like, <laughs> wow. But if I was just, like, waking up and throwing on Netflix and not out sitting on the patio looking for, you know, something cool in the lightning storm, mm-hmm. I would have missed it. Yeah. You know, so just just look for it. Put yourself well, in a position. And that was the, the context of that story. That was you being intentional to go spend time with your Heavenly Father. And you happened to put yourself in a place where, you you know, God showed you how big he was. Mm-hmm. And that if he's that big, then he can handle whatever's going on. Yep. And yep. so I think intentionality plays a big role in, you know, experiencing the extraordinary. You're, you're more prone. You're in a posture to see the extraordinary. Yep. Um, if you're super busy on Netflix, you know, phone, text, social media, like first thing and all day long, and then you go to bed that way. Yep. You miss it sometimes. Yep. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I feel like I mentioned this on the podcast way too much, but, and it's a, it's, I think it's even a cliche, another one of those cliches in our culture, but just practicing gratitude, you know, uh, like it's just happy people are grateful people. And so, you know, I've kept a journal with, with gratitude stuff for a long time now. And mm-hmm. 90% of the time I'm writing down the same things every single day. So I'm thankful for my home. I'm thankful for Ashley. I'm thankful for Grayson. I'm thankful for my job. I'm thankful for financial provision, but I need to be reminded every single day that mm-hmm. I'm thankful for those things or else I'm going to forget it very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden I'm going to go, I'm not that thankful for Ashley. I'm not that thankful for my son. You know what I mean? You forget those things quickly. So mm-hmm. yeah, just look for it. Sure. Yeah. I like it. We go very quickly to discontentment, especially in our culture. Mm hmm. So yeah. last, last question, uh, how does being extraordinary impact others around us? How can we impact the lives and life, life of those around us? I think, um, you know, I would just circle back to what I said on Sunday. I think um, if you're going through hardship or difficulty, there's no way not to feel that. There's no way not to be human and have to process that and maybe get ugly when you process that. In other words, if you unfilter really what you're feeling, that can get pretty ugly and I've needed the space to get pretty ugly in some hardships and I've needed others to come alongside of me and empathize and meet me and just be with me in those hard moments of life but at the same time I also think um, having perspective to go the hardships that are coming my way James painted and framed it well in James 1 where he said there's something at work that I should consider this perhaps as a good thing, not exclusively as a bad thing, because it will produce something in me. And that vantage point or framing it from that perspective to go, it can produce a deeper level of um, contentment and joy and satisfaction and authenticity in my faith. Like it begins to refine my faith in a much more real and authentic way. And that's part of the hardship. And to think about what it will develop in me so as a father I can sit on the other side of my sons and be able to speak into the moments, hard moments in their future. I can give them wisdom. I wouldn't be able to give that wisdom if I wasn't sitting where I am today in this hardship. So to consider that and to go, that's perspective. And to consider that my perseverance, that my sons are watching, that people are watching. And they're saying that I believe in a God who rescues. I believe in a God who redeems. I believe in a God who restores. I believe in a God who forgives. 
and they're watching my perseverance and if that faith is going to be genuinely lived out in me and that my life is a witness to Christ and that I can inspire people through persevering. It may not change anything about my circumstances, but it can change the world around me. And I think just knowing and having those handles then does allow me to pray, you know, God, whatever's going on here, I know you can use it. So just use it until you choose to remove it. And I think that in itself is really what's going to impact people around me. That is a different response to hardships and difficulties. Now, I'm not saying don't be real, don't be human, don't get ugly, because we need to be human and be ugly in terms of hardships. That's real. That needs to go somewhere. That energy has to go somewhere. But I think also having the perspective of what I talked about on Sunday, it really allows the world to be inspired by your life. Yeah, yeah. I had a conversation with somebody I was inspired uh, last week, and I just thought of this, mm -hmm. and he is a regular listener on this podcast, and I didn't ask him if I could share this, so I won't won't say his name, but I'm going to share this. Sure. But uh, he's been married, uh, about to celebrate 47 years of marriage, and I anytime I meet somebody who's like 40 plus, I just want to go, what's the secret? What's yeah. the secret? Like, I have a life goal of 50 years of marriage. Hopefully, mm -hmm. I can live long enough, but what's the secret? And he just said, he paused for quite a while, and then he said, honor your commitment. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's easy, but it's always good. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man. That's some like wisdom right there. Yeah, that is good. Yeah. See, it's and, and it's inspiring. Yeah. It's yeah. I, and again, it's it we know this. These are again what I said on Sunday. Books are written about perseverance and hardship. Mm -hmm. Movies are produced about people who endured and persevered and were faithful in the midst of difficulty. So it is by very nature in, inspirational. Yep. And it can inspire people. So yep. I think just not losing sight of that. That's just one of the motivators. You have to have a lot of them, but one of the motivators to persevere. Yep, for sure. I want to end, end the podcast just uh, sharing a psalm that was uh, came to me in a season where I was coming out of a liminal space mm. and kind of just right, you know, opening the door to step out of it. And I just, I love the way David describes it. And, you know, he's, he, has a journal that's been essentially recorded in the Old Testament in the book mm -hmm. of Psalms. And so we kind of get to read his his writings, and he's very artistic. But I'll just read this, and we'll wrap up with this. Sure. Um, he's, he writes, I waited on the Lord to help me. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground. He steadied me as I walked along. He gave me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. And then I love the last part. Many will see what he has done and be amazed, and they will put their trust in the Lord. Mm. And I, I just love that. It, it, he set my feet on solid ground. He steadied me as I walked along. To whoever's listening or watching right now, I just I just pray that, you know, God can set your feet on solid ground and steady you as you walk. So uh, we're going to pick up next week on with part two mm -hmm. of Extraordinary and uh, jumping in to learn about another extraordinary, ordinary person with extraordinary principles we can learn. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.